Any questions so far on integral equation? So we are in the last section. And it looks complicated, but actually we have seen something like that before when we talk about the green function and uh, self join ODE. So we have seen something similar. So, uh, so the idea is first, very, uh, the end of the form is very similar. So basically it's uh, kind of looking at the same thing using different, different, different perspective. Okay, so, uh, so this method is for a symmetric kernel. And last time we showed that uh, it can be a, a little bit more general than that. If the form is uh, not exactly symmetric, then you can, sometimes you can make it symmetric. That's uh, what we did last time. So now this time we assume that, that after you, you make it symmetric, um, we, could, we could first solve for the eigenfunction and make it the eigenfunction problem first. So uh, for eigenfunction problem, you, you uh, have a homogeneous, uh, integral equation, and we are doing it for the fret home type. So we have uh, a known function equals lambda integral a to t with the kernel. Okay, so this is a homogeneous and the flat home of the second kind because you have this phi outside and it's basically I, an eigenvalue problem and lambda is the eigenvalue. And now we restrict to the symmetric or you can generalize that to a uh, permission one. If you put a complex conjugate, if it is uh, real, of course, uh, it doesn't matter. Complex conjugate is just the same. So, but the, the same thing applied for if K is a, is a complex, you can, the same theory applied for self adjoint or Hermitian kernel. Okay. And the idea is that uh, this, when, when this happened, uh, just like the Hermitian uh, ODE, the uh, differential operator, the eigenvalue problem will result in uh, a set of eigenvalues, an eigenfunction. And the eigenvalues will be all real. And the eigenfunction, you can make it uh, awful normal. So that's, uh, that's what we did uh, in the ODE uh, discussion. So the idea is uh, uh, this, this, this property will, will, will make that happen. And the permission uh, property of the kernel will also make the self adjoint of the uh, eigen, uh, the, the scalar product. So, um, so there's a discussion uh, in, in the textbook or there, but the, to be more specific, although we, we, we did that before, uh, if we solve the, so if we can give it some label, if we can solve it, of, of course, uh, how to solve that depends on the form of K, this is it's a general situation. Assuming you can solve it and solve of a set of um, uh, eigenvalues, say so like uh, if this is uh, the i eigenvalue, eigenfunction, there's the i eigenvalue, and this is i, okay? And now to show that um, the eigenvalue is a real, what we can do is uh, um, say, this is for i, but we can write down the same thing for j, y j, we have a lambda j. Okay. Okay. 
Okay, we, we have done something similar uh, quite a few times, but uh, let's just go through the process. So the idea is that uh, we multiply one from the other, one multiply these two together, integrate over the, this range of, of the, oh, this uh, domain. Okay, but uh, to do that, uh, we actually want to do a complex conjugate first. So like, uh, uh, so this is your eigenvalue equation. Let's see, you take a complex conjugate. Now, uh, we don't know the property of the lambda for now. So we take the complex conjugate here and complex conjugate. Okay. okay. So, so then uh, you can just uh, say if you uh, divided this to phi i, it's and then multiply by phi j conjugate and integrate over um, a to b and dx. And this is divided by one over lambda i. Okay. And that will be just this one equals to this one. The right hand side divided by this lambda i. So you have a to b, a x t, and then you have phi i t. And then you uh, multiply by phi j x. That's conjugate, and you this is dt, and you do a dx an integral over x also. Okay, so so just use that multiplied by phi j complex conjugate and integrate over this range of x, right? So that this one divided by the eigenvalue will be given by this one. Okay, so that is this one. And we can do the same thing by using this equation at this time we multiply by phi i over here and then divided by phi j complex conjugate. So you have phi j complex conjugate integrated by, so multiply phi i here, phi j complex conjugate. It's now we have uh, integrating the, the right hand side. Now this one is K complex conjugate. It's T. And then you have uh, a <coughs> I. Uh, Phi i x, right? Because this is x and phi j t. Okay, just this one to this one. Now, this two, uh, you can put this two to be the same. Now, if you just, uh, first of all, using this property, so this one, the complex conjugate, this is just this one. So you change that to K, but you need to interchange X and T. So basically without writing it another line, I just do this, so cancel the complex conjugate, and then I need to change T and X, right? You can follow that, right? Now this one and this one is basically the same. If we define my X and T, because now we integrate over both X and T, so both are just the integration variable. I can call call the integration whatever I want, call the integration variable whatever I want. So if I recall that, uh, if I in, interchange the uh, variable called tx and called xt, then it's basically this is t, this is x, this is x, this is t, this is t, this is x. 
right? You can do that. No, these two are exactly the same, right? So then we can subtract the two. So what I have here is one over lambda i minus one over lambda j, one plus conjugate, integrate over this range. Yes. Okay. Now, what, what it means is that uh, if uh, if i is not equal to j, if lambda i is not equal to lambda j compared to the gate, if this is not if this is not the same, then this must be uh, this must be zero. So they are orthogonal. So lambda i and lambda uh, phi i and phi j is eigenvalue must be the eigenfunction must be orthogonal to each other. So uh, that's just uh, the uh, consequence of this one. Of course, uh, sometimes you have a uh, degenerate, uh, degenerate uh, complex uh, I mean, eigenvalues and you need to do a ground smooth method to construct orthonormal, uh, or, I mean, orthogonal eigenfunction. Okay. Now the idea is that uh, if i is equals to j, if i equals to j, this is the function multiplied by the function, the complex conjugate of the function. So, so let let us write it explicitly. If i not equals to j, or I say the lambda i not equals to lambda j. And uh, you have this phi i and two. So you have this uh, awful uh, orthogonal condition. If i equals to j, then you have one over lambda i minus one over lambda i on plus conjugate. That uh, you have uh, a to the phi i okay, and this is real because this is a phi i uh, functions absolute value square because the multiplied by is complex conjugate, so this is real. Now this is zero, it means that the lambda i must be equals to lambda i complex conjugate. So uh, lambda i will. Okay, so if this is zero and this is non-zero, generally non-zero because it's absolute value square and integrate over the whole range, unless it's identically zero, Otherwise, this is not zero. If this is not zero, then uh, lambda i and lambda i complex conjugate is the same, so it's real. Okay, so that's uh, that's the process. Of, well, just like what we did for the differential operator, this is the integral operator, but the end up the exactly the same. Okay, so uh, so that is it. So if it means that uh, if you can solve this eigenvalue problem for the integral equation, then uh, then you have these two property. Okay, you have this property and this property, and of course, uh, you might worry about the uh, lambda is zero. If lambda is zero, this is one over zero. Then you have problem. But uh, but zero lambda uh, eigenvalue you go back to here because uh, phi, this integral equation has this lambda here. If lambda is zero, it means that the phi is exactly zero. So the only situation when you have a zero eigenvalue is that uh, the eigenfunction is exactly zero. Okay, unless of course, uh, if phi is singular, then if we exclude singular function, then uh, zero eigenvalue will imply identically zero to 
basically a tree field solution. Okay, so we don't need to worry about that situation. All right. Now, of course, uh, we still have the task of solving this one. And now it depends on what the, exactly the form of K. So uh, if the form of K is unfamiliar, but sometimes uh, if the limits are fam familiar, like uh, for example, uh, if you integrate minus one to one, and you know that uh, you have a set of eigenfunction that is awful normal from the, the domain of minus one to one and integrate X, like uh, that a, a few different uh, function have, ha, that have the same property, but the one set is the Lagrange polynomial, right? If you have a Lagrange polynomial, if you normalize them, you satisfy this one, then uh, although the, the, this K is, uh, may not be a, uh, a familiar form, if you actually satisfy this, differential equation and phi, you can spawn a, a set of phi that satisfy the awful normal condition. And this actually suggests you to do an expansion of all the, uh, all the function here, phi and k in terms of your set of uh, awful normal function. And that can give you a, a, a expansion of the solution phi, okay? So basically this is the reverse process. So now assuming that you have a, phi, a set of awful normal, so you define your awful normal set, so a, b, phi, i, x, i, j. You normalize that, so that becomes a, a conical delta, okay? Now you, if you use this set, if you know this phi, this eigenfunction, and these I corresponding eigenvalues, now you want to solve this eigen, this integral equation in, as an eigenvalue problem, then what you have is, uh, what you can do is do expansion of phi, so, uh, uh, see. Uh, I'll take the expansion of K, right? Because K is X and T, right? And because of the sy symmetric situation, because uh, if you exchange X and T, you get to a complex conjugate. So that suggests you that uh, you are, in this expansion, you only have a, top, a single expansion, you don't need the double expansion because you X and T. But then because of this condition, when you interchange X and T, you should get exactly the same thing with the complex conjugate. So that suggests you, you are coefficient A sub N, and then you have a, like, a, depends on what you, you want, like, like phi I in terms of X and phi I complex conjugate as a function of t, okay? And a should be real because uh, now if you interchange x and t, right? You interchange x and t's, and you take the complex conjugate, so this one, this you will get exactly the same because this becomes t, and then they take the complex conjugate, this becomes x, they take the complex conjugate, this becomes the same. Only thing is a becomes a, a complex conjugate, or the a sub n, I should say, this is a. All the a sub n, uh, uh, so this become a complex conjugate, and they should be the same. It means that the uh, a sub n should be real, okay? And we'll see that. So we use that and substitute into here. So what I have is phi i x equals the lambda i. And we, we, now this becomes a, a sum. E n 
five in x, five in complex conjugate t, multiply by this five i, right? I just substitute my expansion with unknown coefficient here, right? But now uh, I have this I have this condition. So this becomes a conjugate delta delta n i. Okay, and then after I do the sum, so all I ch I change all the n becomes i because uh, this the sum over n this is. This integration after the integration, this is delta n i, so i uh, n just changed to i. Okay, so this this means that uh, this equals the lambda i only the uh, a i left, and then you have phi i x. Okay. So compare this with that, this means that the uh, sub i equals to one over lambda sub i. Okay, so by just expanding your kernel into this uh, orthonormal set of eigenfunction, then the coefficient you know that must be equals to the eigenvalue. Okay, so. Means that uh, so this going back to here, so k x t equals the sum over this uh, phi i x phi i. I'm using n n phi n t divided by phi lambda n. Okay, so that is uh, that is your uh, expansion of k, and all these eigenvalue will be coming from this equation. Whatever this k is, whatever your uh, eigen uh, your, your basis function phi, you plug in a basis function and do the integration and that should give you back to the that basis function, right? And then the, you can get the eigenvalue this way. Once you have eigenvalue, then the, this K will be given by this expansion. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the process for this uh, eigenvalue problem. So in integral equation, okay? And the final result is this 20.80. Okay, and of course it depends on exactly what the K is and the textbook has a discussion that uh, not all kernel is, this method is possible, especially the range that the uh, example, you have a range from zero to infinity. So that is, uh, but that situation, so you don't have discrete set of uh, eigenfunction. So it, actually should have this uh, continuous set of, uh, of uh, eigenfunction. Okay, so, so this form uh, may not uh, apply to all possible uh, integral problem, integral equation problem. Okay, so, but uh, for, uh, so depends on the situation of exactly what, K, what, what the kernel is. And this will give you the one representation of the of your kernel and use that to solve the uh, integral equation. So what next, uh, what we'll do next is, uh, now once we solve this, once we solve this uh, eigenvalue problem, the next step, what we want to do is uh, to, to use it to solve the, Inhomogeneous problem, inhomogeneous equation. And I think we, we're done with this because this is just the, the process to show that the uh, eigenvalues are real and eigenfunctions are orthogonal to each other. So 
what we want to do is to solve the, at least formally, find a form uh, of the solution for the inhomogeneous equation. So you have phi x. So the equation is phi x. Because okay, so now you have the inhomogeneous function fx n plus lambda. Okay. Phi t t. okay. So after we solve this set of eigenfunction and eigenvalue, we can use the these basis function after they, they are normalized, so it becomes off normal. You can use this as the expansion of the, the same kernel, even for the inhomogeneous case, you use this one, okay, in here. Now the idea is that uh, we can use the same set of basis to explain phi and F and like a this way out. Phi x would be less than what the textbook use. Phi x is uh, sum over a, sum over n, n sub n, and phi n. So this is just an unknown ex expansion with the unknown from unknown coefficient a sub n, which is different from this a sub n. Okay, so this is this is the eigenvalue problem, but the. Now we want to find this phi as a uh, solution for this integral equation. Okay. And we do the same thing for f. f x is uh, sum of n. And what is the text we use? b sub n. Okay. Now this, this is not unknown because f is known. Supposedly, you can solve b sub n uh, by just taking the scalar product for both sides and integrate over the range because of the, I erase that, the, uh, the orthogonal of, of a normal condition that you can solve for b sub n. You know, you know this process. So b sub n's are given. What you want to do is solve for a sub n. Okay, so you, you substitute this and that into the equation. So what you have is a sum of a sub n, a sub n or equals to sum of a b sub n or uh, f, yeah, phi sub n. Okay, so this is this, this is that, plus now you have lambda and k becomes that one lambda sum over n, phi n x divided by lambda n, and then the integrate zero to uh, from a to b, phi n complex conjugate t, and then phi t, phi t now, phi is this one, phi is this one, and then let's, now we cannot use the same n because we already use n. Now inside here, uh, inside here, we use another submission variable like m. Now you have a, a sub m and phi sub m yeah, as function of t, integrate dt. Okay. Now the idea is uh, this integration phi sub m compass conjugate and phi sub m integrated, that becomes a conical delta. So this is delta n m, the sum of m, so you change m to n. Okay, so that basically is this a. After you do the integration and the summation, you end up with just a sub n. Okay, so this is a sub n. Right. Okay, and you have an a sub n here, and you have a sub n here, you can combine the two, and then, uh, so this is combining the two, you have this, this is basically a sub n one minus whatever this is, 
whatever it is. No. It's, no. Yeah, so lambda minus lambda in to get this way out here. A sub n, this is one. And move that to the other side, minus lambda over lambda sub n. Y n. Now only this term left. Over function of x. Okay, so this means that the uh, a sub n is given by a sub n divided by one minus lambda over lambda sub n. Okay, so that would be a solution. I think uh, this is in. Uh, uh, did I miss anything? Uh, this is, should be twenty one point eighty seven. And I'm just looking at 21.8.88. I think it's just uh, rearranging that. Uh, I think it's exactly the same. Yeah, yeah, it's just changing into in two factors. So basically, this is just you want to have a base of n here out, and then you press. So basically, this one minus one, so base of n uh, over lambda n minus lambda, and multiply by lambda. N. So that is this one, and then minus one becomes minus lambda n plus lambda. So cancel okay, so this one, so lambda over lambda n minus lambda. So this is this is your equation twenty point eighty eight. Okay, so the the reason is written this way is that uh, now the solution now the solution phi can be written at uh, out explicitly phi. Because you have a b sub n here, when you took pick, put it here, the first term will give you this uh, just the f function, and then the next step would be just uh, writing it as a summation. Uh, my limit is different from here. Uh, I mean, the textbook is one to infinity. It doesn't matter. It's just the, how you count it. Uh, so that is uh, a sub n, a sub n would be just you have a b sub n. And you could use a b sub n into this one. So that is phi n x. And then n minus lambda and then uh, then the the rest is sum over b you have a b sub n and then uh, and then the b sub n is is using the the inverse of that one inverse of that one to multiply by uh, phi n and then phi n complex conjugate and then integrate over the, the, do the domain. So this is b sub n, a to b 
as T complex conjugate T. Okay, so this is your B sub N. Okay, a textbook doesn't have the complex conjugate because it's assuming a just symmetric instead of permission. But this becomes the, the formula. So this one will be the solution to this one using a set of basis function phi. So, um, so that would be uh, at least formally you get a solution out. Okay. So the process will be if you're given by one of these uh, integral equation, homogeneous equation, first you solve the homogeneous one, basically solve an eigenvalue eigenvector. That depends on what K is. Once you have that set of eigenfunction, eigenvector, and the inhomogeneous one is given by just this one, because you have these eigenvalues and eigen, eigenvectors, eigenfunctions. Okay, so the formula, you can do that. Okay. Is it is it clear that that whole thing? Okay. Uh, so the exact application is quite trivial. Except, um, like in the next example, is uh, just um, the homogeneous part is just what uh, we did in the classroom. So and. That part you use a separable variable, separable kernel, and solve for the two eigenfunction, two eigenvector. We did that in class, and then you have an inhomogeneous term. So basically, then you have everything. Just plug that back into this formula. You get the solution for this the inhomogeneous equation. Okay, so that is pretty trivial. All right. So uh, the last remark is that this. Yeah, this whole idea uh, in the green function chapter, we call this the green function. Basically in, in that situation, we are converting a, a differential equation to integral equation because we put part of the differential equation to the right-hand side, although it still depends, to, still proportional to the unknown function. We just solve the rest of the differential operator and, uh, use that uh, as an eigenvalue problem and use those eigenvalues to eigenvalue eigenfunction to construct the green function and the green function is exactly this one. Okay. And we put this green function back to here. So basically this is like a green function and you put the integration out, this sum over this one, the whole thing, put it back to here. It's just, just a green function or, I mean, it actually including this one or just, Going back to here, so this uh, this this phi is is like uh, you put it back together. It's just like a green function, or, or put it back to here, put it back to here. This is like a green function, right? So uh, so you just look at exact, exactly the same thing using different way. So instead of using, looking at it as a differential operator and get a green function, now you use the integral equation with a symmetric kernel, then you get the exactly the same formula. Okay, so, uh, so that's not uh, too difficult. Any question about this? This is the final topic in the integration equation chapter. And the application should be straightforward. Okay. No, no question. Okay, if no question, then I will move on. Move on to the next chapter. So the calculus of variations. Okay. And the first concept is to introduce is uh, the variation of a so-called functional. You heard about functional before, anyone? No, not, not really. So a function is uh, 
we, we know that given a variable, you plug in a, a function, then give you another variable. So a value give you another value. Basically, it's just a mapping, mapping one value to another value. That's function, and you have other restriction like a, like one to one, that kind of thing. Or you can also also impose a continuity, that kind of a, a restriction to a function, the definition of a function. But a function though is different in the sense that uh, the input is not just one value, it's a function. So uh, the first form that we will uh, we'll consider is uh, of this form of uh, equation 22.1. Basically, you have a function of j and in your textbook, using the square bracket as your the indication that you put the input here. And the input is a function, like a y is, if you say y is a function x, you put the whole function in. And once you put the whole function in this function, now you get a value. So j would be the value of the uh, functional. And what we mean by uh, the whole value is that uh, this depends on the x, depends on all x, y value of over the whole, whole domain of x that you define your function. So the function y, okay? And that usually will be uh, expressed as a, in a form of integration because the integration will take the whole range of x. Right? Like uh, this is integrating over a to b and dx, this is dx, okay? And then uh, the form of uh, integral in the textbook is this any function, when the function f that can depends on x and depends on y and can depends on uh, dy dx and so on. In principle, you can de de depends on all the derivative of y. Okay. But uh, at first we just stop at dy dx. So, we, so f we depends on x, y, and dy dx. But uh, later we can generalize that to a higher derivative also. Okay. So because it's involving an integration, so the value of j, we depends on y at the, all values of x, x from a to b. So that's what we call a functional. All right. And so, so this is a concept that uh, generalizing the function concept one step further. So basically it's not a local dependency, it's not local one local value of y, then you give it another one value j, you know, it's involving y at the whole domain, y value over the whole domain, and that will give you a, a, another value j, okay? So uh, obviously, you, when you define a, a new mathematical object, you can do a, a lot of things uh, over it. Uh, just like you can analyze your function in many different ways and have uh, lots of things you can do. In function, uh, also you have you can do a lot of things. Um, so the whole thing is called functional analysis, and the whole subject is very large and. Uh, we won't go through all that, all these uh, complicating thing. So what we only concern ourselves for now is just uh, the, to calculate the maximum or the, how do you maximize the functional, this value of J or, my, or finding the extremums of J and for a given function Y. Basically we want to find what function Y you get your extremal value of, of j, okay? So that is a gen generalization of the, the problem of um, maximization or minimization of a function. And that is a trivial, trivial question that we, we already know how to do it. Just take the duty of that function and set it to zero. Then you get the condition for extremum. Of course, uh, you, if you want to know whether it's maximum or minimum, you go one step further. Um, either go one, one step further and calculate the second derivatives 
or you just by inspection put the, the your solution back to the function and see whether it's actually is a maximum or minimum. So you can do a different thing. So the same thing happened here. We just concerning this function is finding the extremum, the, the condition for the extremum of, of J. Okay, so that what we do and so this restricted part of a functional analysis is uh, what we in this chapter is called the calculus of variation. Basically, uh, the if you change different y, then uh, the j will change, and this is called a variation. You vary j by vary y, varying y. Okay. So basically, we want to calculate the j, the variation of j by, uh, by y, let's tell the y. Basically changing a y to a y plus delta y. And we want to know the change of this one. So, so this is, or I can define as a delta j. And this is uh, using a delta notation rather than the usual derivative because this is for function though, not just a function. For function, we may use just the usual derivative. So this is basically defined as uh, a j at y plus delta y, changing the function. So y depends on x, delta y also depends on x and the minus j. Okay, so basically you substitute changing y by a little bit and subtract the original functional and define that as the variation. Okay, and now what we want to, to know that is that uh, uh, the condition, what the condition will make this zero. So supposedly if j is an extremal value, so whatever y you, ch you change, change a little bit and over at any location of x. So you vary with j, so, so for y as a function of x is something like that. So whatever that is from a to b. So if this is your function that will, will make j like an extremum, then a variation of that one. So change it a little bit over any location. Right, that would change J, okay? And the, the idea is that when it's, it is an extremum, then a small change of this delta Y, if delta Y is small, then you're actually not getting a diff, difference between this Y plus delta Y, uh, J using Y plus delta Y as the input and that one up to the first order of, of this, small change. So this variation will, will be set to zero. In that case, if this, this is your X, Y that will make J as an extremum. Okay, so that, that is the idea. And then uh, of course, uh, because you have this A and B at the boundary. So that is, uh, then you have different situation. The first situation is that uh, you allowed J to change over the boundary also. And that becomes more complicated. So you have the boundary term to worry about. And uh, the more restricted problem is, the, is that we will require that uh, when you vary that you keep the fix, keep these two terms, this two point fix. And many problem is uh, have the fix delta Y. So you don't, don't let the, uh, Delta Y change over the, at the, at the end point, you just change the interior, okay? So we usually will impose the condition that Delta Y okay, equals the Delta Y in equals to zero, okay? And that is the, that is a more restricted problem. 
Okay. And now the, the idea is now to get the, an equation for y such that uh, when y satisfies that equation, which usually would be a differential equation because y is a function. So that if y satisfies that differential equation, then this delta j would be zero. So we want to find that equation. Okay. All right. To do that, uh, what we will do is, uh, yeah. there are different way to divide this thing, but uh, the textbook just use the concept that, uh, so this is like a more restricted concept. Say, so if now we just let go the y, um, as some parameter alpha, multiplied by a function eta, yeah. And so this eta can be a, a arbitrary subject to the same constraint, a to a equals to a to b equals to zero. Okay, so this fix the delta y to be zero at both endpoints. And alpha is just a parameter, so alpha is just a, it's like a variable here. And so basically this, by setting this, you restrict your delta y. So if you, you're given a function, you're given a function a to so whatever the function you want, or you can go past your negative, this is your a to, okay? And you multiply by alpha variables and add that to y. So basically you add y, basically something like this. Okay, so that would be y plus delta y. Okay, it's just changing delta y according to your eta. But then uh, you argue that the eta is actually chosen arbitrary. You can choose whatever you want. So either this eta or this eta, as long as it satisfies this condition, that doesn't matter. And then the equation derived from this process actually is, is independent of eta. As long as you satisfy the bounding condition, you get exactly the same equation. So that doesn't matter. Okay. Now the idea is that now you only vary J alpha now because you fix eta. If you do that, that uh, J because uh, Y is uh, involving this, uh, this alpha. So it becomes basically returning a function back to a function as a function alpha because you fix the y and delta y or fixing y and eta, you're fixing the, the variation of y. Okay, so what we now can do is uh, doing the, the total derivative of, of j, so dj d alpha and set it to zero. Okay. And now the, so because uh, this J is given by this one. So I'm always out of time. So we want to derive this equation. So Y will depends on, on uh, alpha. And then uh, dy dx we also depends on alpha. Okay, so yeah, the, usually we write it y sub x as, as in terms of dy dx. Okay, and we, we stop at the first derivative. Okay, now the the idea is that uh, you do the derivative inside the integram so a to b f. And when you do the derivative of, of this, so this is a function of x, y as a function of x, and y sub x as a function of x. So everything is a function of x, so you can integrate over x, okay? But uh, only y and yx will vary. So 
So basically, y the delta delta y will be alpha and eta. So delta y x will be alpha eta x. Okay, so that is uh, what it is. So, so when you do a derivative, what you get is uh, partial f, partial y, and then you take the derivative of y with respect to the, with respect to alpha, which will give you eta. Okay, and then press also f also y x and then a to x you know what i'm saying you know what i'm doing so because x doesn't depend on alpha only our y and y x depends on alpha it depends on alpha and i'm taking the derivative over alpha i get this one okay so this is uh, This is uh, equation 20 point 10. Okay, so I'm just out of time. So maybe I, I'll stop here and continue. This is, uh, let, let us remember this. This is, uh, I'm up to uh, 20 point 10. Okay. And I finally will, will want to set it to zero. Okay, but uh, we'll, next time we'll start from here and then divide the condition for that one. Okay. So, uh, all right, any question before we go? All right, so we continue getting this equation. The equation that we get will, will be called the Euler equation in your textbook. Most people will call the Euler Lagrange equation, but uh, it doesn't matter. Okay, all right, so see you on Wednesday.